What is he doing there? What is his purpose? Usually when we see a policeman, we think of some type of punishment or judgment is going to be instituted. Who is he there for? Who's in trouble? The good time that we were having all of a sudden became to a standstill because we knew something was going to happen. And chances of somebody being in trouble or bad news about to happen, something was going to dampen the party and the enjoyment that we were having. And I think that's kind of what all of a sudden took place in heaven. And all of a sudden, this silence fell over everybody. In comparison to these people, knew what it meant when a seal was open. I think of this in the case of what we see in verse 1. Every time, like I said, a seal was open, something was going to be executed. And in this case, judgment was going to befall the earth. The joy of people were experiencing all of a sudden came to a standstill. God's judgment was about to be administered. And it was a fearful time for some. They were wondering what's going to happen. And it's a fearful thing to be on the side of God's wrath. And it's a sad time because God's judgment is about to be administered. If only people had listened You know, I believe God, with His love, He hates to administer judgment, punishment. But yet, that's who God is. He's a God of justice plus a God of love. So let's take a look this morning, beginning with the second verse, the trumpet judgments. And we're going to just take a look at four quickly this morning as the the time that we have allowed it here. In verse 2 it says, And I saw seven angels which stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. Now we may wonder, well, why trumpets? Well, I'm not going to go into it, but much of my reading that I did in research, trumpets were oftentimes used uh, in, in the land of Israel. Sometimes a trumpet could be noted to call people to worship. Trumpets could be sounded for battle. We know, or when, uh, when the resurrection, we're, we're going to hear a trumpet blast, and, and that's assembling together before God. And there's other ways that trumpets have been used throughout Scripture. You know, I think of, of the, the people when they watched, marched around the city of Jericho. What did they do? They marched around every day. They marched around what? One time, didn't they? Then on the seventh day, they marched around how many times? Seven times? And then what did they do after the seventh time? They blew the trumpets and what? The walls came tumbling down, didn't they? Because of their obedience uh, to God to follow what God told them to do, God came to their rescue and the city, the walls fell down and they were able to go in and conquer that city. But again, there was judgment that was being brought by the sound of trumpets. Well, anyway, there's seven trumpets. And in these verses... There's instruments of judgment, of ju- uh, well, instruments of justice and judgment. Picture this with me if you would. There are seven angels who, who lurched out of the book of destiny and immediately take their place before God, and God hands them trumpets, one trumpet for each angel. And again, note this, that the seven angels come forth with seven, uh, with the, when the seventh seal is broken. And oftentimes the last seal introduces the next progression of judgment that God is going to present. And in this case, they come forth with the trumpets. The trumpets always symbolize God's intervention into human history. The judgments of God are about to befall only on the unbelieving world, only upon those who follow the Antichrist, only on those who have the mark of the beast. The host of heaven knows something. When God's hands His mighty messenger, seven trumpets, the judgments about to take place, will come directly from God himself. Imagine the angel standing there, broad, erect, ready to receive the command that God has for them. Now, the second instrument we see is not only justice, but it is the prayers of all the saints and believers. We see this in verse 4. And the smoke of the incense, it says, which came with the prayers of the saints, sending out before God out of the hand out of the angels' hands. No, these are the prayers of all the saints. Some were in heaven and some were still on earth, 
but all had suffered some and were still some were still suffering persecution of the antichrist and his government you know these are the prayers that have been lifted up to god and god finally says okay enough is enough now judgment needs to take place you know one day is coming when god is going to answer the prayers of his dear people and it may not just have been those prayers it may have been the prayers of people down through centuries it may be even our prayers as we wonder and say, God, how long are you going to let the evil in this world continue to triumph? You know, don't you wonder sometimes you say, God, why don't you punish that piece? Or God, why don't you do something about this? Well, those prayers have all been stored up. And the time has come when God says, okay, I'm answering your prayers. And this is what takes place. God's going to answer the prayers. He's going to cast judgment against the Antichrist and his government, those who follow him, all those who have opposed God, all those who have stood against God are going to suffer judgment, the most horrible judgment imaginable. All who have rebelled against Jesus Christ, rejected, denied, cursed, ignored, neglected, disobeyed, disbelieved him, all will be judged. The judgment of God is going to fall upon the earth. And they uh, who have been cruel and inhumane shall now suffer the horrible punishment, the most punishment imaginable. The punishment shall come from him who is just and righteous as well as love. God is going to hear the prayers of his dear people, his followers, who have suffered so much at the hands of a godless society that those who follow the savagery of the Antichrist. Let me add something in here. I was reading and ran across a book called The Revelation of John by a man named George Ladd. And I want to quote him, and he says this, The wrath of God is not merely judicial. It also embodies a merciful purpose. It is designed to drive man to their knees by harsh experiences while the time for decision remains, before it is too late. And this is hinted in several passages. He said, after the sixth trumpet, he said, he, he said, I read this, the rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues did not repent the works of their hands, nor give up worshiping demons or idols. You know, when man is confronted by the wrath of God in judgment, they should be humbled, repentant, and turn from their wickedness to worship God of heaven. The same note resounds in, he says, also in connection with the bowl wraths. He said, after the fifth bowl, we read that those men cursed God of heaven for their, play, for their pain and their sores and did not repent of their deeds. He goes on to say, if it is possible to drive men to repentance, the plagues and the trumpets and the bowls would do so, end quote. You know, in my opinion, this is not pleasant for God to do. At the heart of God's mercy, God's wanting people to turn from their sinful ways and to acknowledge the love and mercy that He has for them. God is hoping that this punishment will lead them to a repentance and accept the free gift of salvation through His Son, Jesus Christ, which is preached to the world through His messengers. But for many, it will not be the case. But there will be, yes, will be those who turn to Christ during this time. Now in verse 5, we see God's wrath begin. It said, And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire of the altar and cast it to the earth. And there were voices and thunderings and lightnings and an earthquake. You know, the angel cast both the fire and the prayers of the saints upon earth. When he does, all the voices upon earth began to wonder and question, what is this enormous increase in violent thunderstorms and their thunderings and lightnings? An enormous increase in earthquakes. Ungodly millions upon the earth will know something is about to happen, something terrible. And it is. The judgment of God is about to fall upon the ungodly world. The great tribulation is now being launched. They're in the tribulation, but this will be what many call the great tribulation. This is when God comes upon the scene. Be prior to that, it's been the Antichrist and the evil things that, that he has done, that God allowed 
to be done through him. But God steps forth now in the trumpets, and this is coming from the hand of God himself. For thousands of years, God has warned men that he was going to execute judgment upon this corrupt world and the ungodly. Let me share with you some verses from different portions of Scripture which also talk about this. I think of Jude chapter 14. It says, And Enoch also, the seventh from Adam, prophesied these, saying, Behold, the Lord cometh with ten thousand of his saints. In Acts chapter 17, verse 31, it says, Because he hath appointed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness by that man whom he hath ordained, whereof he hath given assurance to all men in that he raised him from the dead. I think of Romans chapter 1, verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed against heaven upon, against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men, whom hold the truth in unrighteousness. Or in Psalm 96, verse 13, Before the Lord, for he cometh, for he cometh to judge the earth, and he shall judge the world with righteousness and the people with his truth. For thousands of years, God said, Hey, I'm going to judge the world. People realize this. Get right with me. And then in verses 6 through 13, there's suffering on the earth. The blast of the first four trumpets. Verse 6 tells that the angels take their place and prepare to sound their trumpets. And as they do, they are about to see one whore after the other visit the earth and her inhabitants. The first one we see in verse 7, the trumpet of devastation. The first trumpet brings hail and fire mingled with blood. Has there ever been a time... God rained down fire from heaven? Can you ever think of a time in the Old Testament? Was there a wicked city? Yeah. Sodom and Gomorrah was literally destroyed by God because of their perverse, so they became so perverse. Well, here again, hail and fire mingled with blood. This may be a description of hail falling from the skies, mingled with lava from volcanic eruptions. Blood might be that of men and animals killed in the, in the catechism here. Or, or it could refer to the contaminated water droplets that have an appearance of blood. Whatever the nature of this judgment, this storm of wrath falls upon the earth and it burns up one-third of the trees on the earth along with one-third of the grass. Now, can you imagine one-third of the trees and one-third of the grass? Well, we don't think much of that, but, but if you think about it, what are the results of, of that happening? Well, oxygen level would begin to deteriorate. What makes oxygen for us? Trees, the grass, the flower, you know, all that produces oxygen, but when one-third of that is destroyed, can you imagine the level of oxygen in our world? Or food sources drying up. Fruit, grain, you know, meat, you know, all these things are going to be destroyed. There's going to be a great geological, ecological, and uh, disaster taking place during this time because of what happens one-third of the world. Then in verses 8 through 9, we see a trumpet of what I call destruction. When the second trumpet sounds, a fiery mountain is seen falling into the sea. One-third of the sea is contaminated. One-third of the marine life dies, and one-third of all human ships are destroyed. This could be a description of a meteor falling out of space and hitting the oceans. And if that were to happen, it could easily destroy one-third of all the sea life. It could would contaminate the oceans with dead and rotting bodies of marine life. It would also trigger massive tidal waves that could sink great number of ships. There would be rusty hulls would choke out the shipping lanes and hinder the movement of men and materials. Mankind would be very dependent upon the resources that it retrieves from the sea, but when the oceans are taken away, the source of life and livelihood of man, man will suffer from hunger and Economic disaster. I wrote in my notes, remember the economic disaster we had when a ship got stuck in the mud in the Suez Canal or became broadside? 
Now, I looked up this week, and it, it called it the evergreen, but it, they call it the ever-given. You know, how it became stuck in there, and it, it affected around the world. The billions of dollars that people were losing each and every day because ships couldn't go through the Suez Canal and deliver all their merchandise around the world. So can you imagine what it would be like when one-third of all the ships and, and the contamination of all the seas? Folks, we haven't seen nothing yet. What we experienced isn't a drop in a bucket of what is going to happen someday in the future. Then in verses 10 through 11, I call it the trumpet of death. Another object falls from heaven. It is probably a comet since it is described as having a tail. It falls upon the fountains of the fresh waters and causes them to be poisoned. The word wormwood that some of you may have in your scriptures is, is, means bitterness. It refers to a plant whose leaves are used to manufacture this drink that is so bitter. The alcoholic beverage of this toxic was banned in many countries. And one-third of the sweet and fresh waters of earth are poisoned and will, many will die drinking these tainted waters. Folks, can you imagine being alive during this time? I can't, I can't imagine. You know, we think we're, we're having it hard now, but imagine what the world is going to be like. But praise God, we as Christians aren't going to be here. You know, we're going to be in heaven. We're going to be in heaven, and we're going to come back with Christ as He sets up His new kingdom. But friends, this is going to happen. This is what we need to warn people of. And the reason I believe and I get fired up about sharing these messages is so that we realize we know the future. We know what's going to happen. We have a message to share with those who are not right with Christ. We need to warn them and say, hey, you don't want to be here during this time. You don't want to go through this. You know, they, we, and, and we don't want them to run to Christ just because they're fearful of this. We want them to run to Christ because they come to the ultimate point to realize that they are sinners in need of salvation. You know, real conversion takes place when a person realizes their sin before an holy God. You know, they don't just turn to God because, oh God, I don't want to go through this time. I accept you. Well, that's that's, to me, not real conversion. Real conversion is when we are real repentant, remorseful of our sins before God. And we say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. God, I have sinned against you, and I am not deserving of my sins to be forgiven. Jesus Christ died for me, and I receive that gift through Jesus Christ. Please forgive me of my sins. And we come into a relationship through what Jesus Christ did for us. Let me go on to the trumpet of darkness we see in verse 12. When the fourth trumpet sounds, God turns the power of the sun and the moon and the stars. He turns it down. The power is reduced by one-third. So you can imagine the sun not producing like it has been one-third, or the moon, or the stars. They are dimmed. When they do shine, they are not bright. They do not shine as long, or as long as they used to. This could be a result of all the ash and debris from earlier judgments, or this could be the supernatural hand of God. However, the results are the same. The earth is plunged into darkness as the sun, the moon, and the stars refuse to give their light. This will be the effect of growing seasons, weather patterns, plant life, temperatures on earth, Mankind's physical and emotional health, health. I mean, we're affected right now in this pandemic, many people, by their physical and emotional health. What's probably hurting people more than anything is their emotional health, which affects their physical health. You know, many of us, we're used to doing things, and now all of a sudden we can't do the things that we you, were used to doing. Or, our children, they tell us how... The, the effect during our pandemic now has on children and the suicide rates and, and people turning to, you know, drugs and things of that sort. Can you imagine what it's going to be like during that day? This trumpet will take a great toll upon humanity. 
Then let me just write, share with you what I wrote. I said, since the beginning of time, man has taken God for granted. Man has ignored him, blasphemed, and lived as though he does not exist. Man has also taken God's creation for granted. There, there have always been plenty of trees and grass. There's always been plenty of oxygen to breathe. The seas have always been there, and they yield a wonderful bounty for man as he travels the, and fishes its waters. There's always been plenty of fresh water to drink. We just go to the faucet and water and turn it on and there's nice water we can drink. The sun and the moon and the stars have been in their places and they have given us light. During the tribulation, God will take what man has always taken for granted. Man will be judged for his refusal to bow before God and to acknowledge his lordship. Let me quickly go on to the testimony of doom in verse 13 the chapter closes with an angel flying through heaven pronouncing future woes upon the earth things are bad but not as bad as they will become can you imagine getting worse than what they have been experiencing already but it will happen the worst part of the tribulation still lies ahead and the angel flies around and is giving a woe of what's yet to come. If you've never been saved, and I would say this to those maybe watching, because I know many of you here today have been, but as a preacher, my plea continues to always go out to those who may never have a relationship with God yet. And that should be our plea to everybody. Make sure you're right with God. And if you've never come to a time in your life where you have given your heart and life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says today is the day of salvation. You know, don't put off to tomorrow what you can do today. Like I said, I can give you example after example. People said, hey, I'm going to do this tomorrow, but tomorrow never come. And I can give you a prime example as I did at the beginning. My, young, my cousin, Leanne, never thought that she was just going to go out for a walk never come home well she's at home in heaven but we're not guaranteed the next breath and if you never accepted Jesus Christ do it today if you do it today you will miss these events you won't be involved in this some would say how could these things ever happen because God said it's going to happen and it will there's more that could be said, but the bottom line is this. Judgment is coming upon the earth and upon all those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as Savior. The best thing that you can do today is to be saved by His grace and ready to meet Him when He comes so that you can avoid the tragedies that are coming. Are you saved? Do you know somebody that is not saved? That would probably to apply to many of us here today. No doubt we probably know somebody who is not saved. And my question to you, saints, is what are you going to do about it? What are you going to do about it? Many For many years we just said, well, you know, God will send somebody else. You know, God will send somebody else. When we know ourselves that they are not saved, God may be using you. You know about it. God made it known to you. And God wants to use you. I wrote down in my notes here. Do you know somebody is not saved? What are you going to do about it? If you're not saved, the Bible says, like I said, today is the day to get saved, to get right with God. If you're not right with God, because uh, if you aren't right with God because of the sins that you have committed against God, Romans 3.23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Like I said, for somebody to really truly get right with God, they need to realize that they are sinners. And it is their sins, their rebellion, that have separated them from God. God loves you and wants to have a relationship with you. But it, the fact is, are you willing to accept God's love and God's way to be forgiven and be right with Him? In other words, we have broken God's standard, God's way of living. We are separated from Him spiritually. We are spiritually dead and cannot communicate with God because the Bible says 
they that worship him must worship him in spirit. Our spirit is dead because of sin and unable to worship God. So what do we do? How can we have a right relationship with God? How can we make things right? And in and of ourselves, there's nothing we can do to get right with God. However, God made a way for us to get right with Him. Again, God coming to our rescue. Not us. It's all about God. I wrote down here, we have broken God's laws and we deserve the judgment of God. Continued separation and death. However, Jesus was willing to step in and satisfy the judgment that God had against us. The laws that we had broken were satisfied when Jesus stepped in and became the substitute in our place. The punishment that we deserve, Jesus took upon himself. When Jesus died on the cross, he took upon himself the sins of the entire world. Everyone's debt has been paid for and satisfied to God by Jesus. However, only the ones that are truly right with God are those who admit that they are sinners and accept what Jesus Christ has done for them. They that admit to God and Jesus that they are sinners and are sorry for their rebellious, sinful lives are the ones and the only ones who can become right with God. Not only are we to confess our sins, but we are also desirous to live a life committed to God through Jesus Christ. We surrender our life to the Christ leading. We allow Him the lordship of our lives. From this point on, we are no longer in control of our lives, but Jesus is. We begin to live a life pleasing to God through Jesus. And we become spiritually alive and are able to communicate and live with God. Friend, have you done that? Many of you in this room, if I said, have you done that? You'd say yes. Yes. You know, I remember getting saved at age 12. I knew that God had saved me. He had forgiven me of my sins. But I would have to say that I struggled through my teenage years of allowing him to be, to be the Lord and the master of my life. Yeah, I was willing to accept and, and, and confess my sins but I would say there were times that I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that I was not living honoring to God. As a teenager, I was trying to find myself, so to say, as a lot of times teenagers do. I think there's one thing to be saved, but there's also another time when we allow God really truly to be the Lord and Master of our life. And I remember later on, past my teen years, that I came to the realization that I was, I was, yes, I was a Christian, but I wasn't the Christian God wanted me to be because I wasn't totally surrendered to Him. I wasn't relying upon Him daily apart for His leading, for His Holy Spirit to lead in my life. You might be a Christian today and you know that you're a Christian. You might fall into that category where you know that you're a Christian, but you know that you haven't been turning your life daily over to His leading, His control. There are times in my life that I had to recommit my life. Was that, did that mean I lost my salvation? No, it didn't mean I lost my salvation. It just mean that I, I, I may have gotten lackadaisical. I allowed other things to take precedence over my relationship with God and with Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit working in my life, that I just had to come before God and say, God, I'm so sorry. I allowed other things to take precedence over you. And I know that's not right. Please forgive me. And from this point on, I want to drive down a stake, and it's going to be a, a turning point in my life. I can look back at my life and, and tell you different times, different times where I drove down a stake and, and made a difference difference in my life and maybe there's some here today maybe there's some watching online that you know what I'm talking about and God's speaking to your heart right now and you need to deal with him and get it right with him whatever the case you know we need to turn to God and, and confess our sins to him the Bible says if we do that he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness in other words, clean our slate and say, okay, child, I understand. Now get out there and live for me. I'm here. Turn to me each day and I'll help you. 
You're living in a troubled world, but I'll give you the strength. I'll give you the, I'll give you the hope that you need. Yeah, there's a lot going on in the world, but I can be the strength and the power that you need by turning to me. If that, any of you here today, I hope and pray that in our remaining moments as you just bow your heads and, and confess what God is speaking to you this morning. Maybe there's some watching online this morning and you know that you need to get right with God and you don't know what to say. I'm going to lead in a closing prayer and then we're going to have a closing hymn, but it's, it's much like what I prayed many years ago and that I encourage people to pray when they want to get right with God. So I'm going to just get every head bowed and every eye closed and I'm just going to ask those who may be watching I'm assuming, but, you know, sometimes it's wrong to assume. But if you're here today and you've never trusted Jesus Christ, you just might want to pray this prayer in the sincerity of your heart to God. Say, God, I realize I'm a sinner. God, and as a result of my sins, God, I am separated from you because of my sins. But, God, I don't want to be separated any longer. God, I want to have a relationship with you. God, I don't want to go through those terrible years that that lie in the tribulation. I want to get to know you right now, here today, that I can serve you, that my life can be what you called for me to be, that, that you formed my body. It's a marvelous body, and you've got a purpose for my life, and I want to live out that purpose. Jesus, I believe that you died for me. You became my substitute. You took upon yourself all my sins. And through your death, I can have my sins forgiven by trusting in you. Jesus, please forgive me on my sins. Come into my life. I want you to be the Lord and Master of my life from this point on. Help me each day by the leading of your Holy Spirit, which you give me at the time of conversion that I will live my life pleasing to you. This is my prayer, and this is my desire, Jesus, and I pray it in your name. Amen. If you prayed that prayer upon the authority of the Word of God, you are right with God. And I would encourage you to contact me online on our website and let me know, and I would like to encourage any of you. This morning we're going to end by singing our invitation hymn, and that is number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. And I hope that as we sing this song, we'll allow it to be the prayer of our life, that God will have his own way in our heart and life each and every day of our lives. So let's stand together, sing number 294, Have Thine Own Way, Lord. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way, thou art the potter, I am the clay, mold me and make me after thy will. thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. Search me and try me, Master, today. Wider than snow, Lord, wash me just now. As in Now, as we commit ourselves to the Lord, let's go out and live ourselves for the Lord. Let's go out and look for those opportunities. Say, who is it, Lord, that I can be a blessing to this week? And go out looking with anticipation those that God might bring in your direction that you can say a kind word to or make a, have a kind gesture or sometimes even a smile, just a little word of encouragement. And sure turn somebody's day completely around.
I pray that we would long to be those vessels that God would use to bring that about in somebody's life. By the example that we live, maybe someday we'll find them in heaven. Maybe we won't know of a decision down here, but someday up in heaven they might walk up and say, you know, I watched your life, how you lived your life, and it spoke to me. And I want you to know God used your life to bring me to him. Wouldn't that be glorious someday? Just to have somebody walk up and be able to just hug them and rejoice in the fact that because of your walking in obedience, it made a difference. Someday we're going to stand before God. And I hope right now we're going to say, I want to make a difference. I want to make a difference. For in that day when I stand before my Heavenly Father and He looks at me, winks at me and shakes His head and says, well done. Well done. Wouldn't that be awesome? Let's work towards it, okay? Father, thank you again for our moments together this morning. Now as we go our separate ways, Father, help us to be your vessels. Use us, Father, for your kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you.